Have you ever lost a job? When, um, when Cheryl and I were uh, engaged, the owner of the uh, cheese store in Berkeley, where I worked part-time, decided that I was asking for too much time off and he fired me. He's, I, I thought that I was being very responsible when I typed up that list of all of the dates that I needed off during the next three months. And, and I handed it to him so he could plan. I mean, I, I thought that would be a good thing. Because I had weddings to attend, I had some other events, some other, you know, I was doing some youth ministry things. And I, and I thought, well, why don't I just lay it off so that he knows exactly where, uh, you know, what, what times I needed off. But when I handed it to him and he saw the list, he freaked out. That was not fun. Finding part-time work in a university town is rough, and I never did find any additional long-term work there. Um, have you ever had one of those kinds of desperate panic moments in your life? Yeah, 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 yeah. What was that like? What was it like? Whether it was unemployment or a desperate kind of panic, something that's gone on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one time we went fishing, went, went to the lake fishing, and my husband and I was a young woman. My husband at that time was uh, uh, the boat. You know how the boat hit the sandbar and the boats yes. stopped. And he says, "Well, I can swim back to shore and get help, but you know, shore looks like it's close." Yes. But it wasn't as close as he thought it was, and it was getting dark, so I put the spotlight on, and I saw him when he went down. And I told my mom with the boat, I think he went down. And they're like, no, no, no. But he came back up and he kept swimming. Well, once he got to shore, and we got him when we got to shore, he went in the shop. And so we had to get him to the hospital to get something. My mouth was locked open, eyes locked open, blah, blah, blah. And I was just, you know. And my mother told me, says, you have to slap him all the way to the hospital, or I'm going to put you out on this dark road. Because I was like, just freaking out, right? And I didn't know what to do, but I began to slap, 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 slap. And that was the type of feeling that I felt when you don't have any control over anything. And it's you exactly what it is. You're desperate, desperate, desperate. Desperate, yeah. yeah. desperate kinds of situations. Hey, anyone else have a desperate kind of situation that they've been in? Where there's no, you just can't see the way out of it, how things are going to resolve? Uh, things were not looking good for Ezekiel. Uh, he was a brilliant 30-year-old priest dragged into the Babylonian exile when things were starting to unravel in Jerusalem. Uh, the, the politicians had, had played their cards wrong and the Babylonian mar army had marched into Jerusalem and they had hauled off many of the up-and-coming Jewish movers and shakers at that point. That effectively put an end to the priestly career of Ezekiel. Think about it. I mean, the Babylonians had not yet destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. They were about, they were going to do that in a couple of years. But, but even as an exilee uh, in a hostile foreign country with, with an oppressive government, it, being there made it impossible for Ezekiel to show up for his shift at the temple back in Jerusalem. And a priest without a temple is only a priest in name. He had, he had just barely gotten started in the temple. He was a young guy, and, and he, he had probably not even been there long enough to learn all the ropes uh, but before the soldiers dragged him to the Babylonian captivity. And, and, and as we piece all of the, the details together, it seems that he had been in Babylonia uh, probably 10, 12 years before the Lord called him to do something new. Although it was not a job that he was called to, it was a calling. So I, I want to spend a few moments this morning talking about this idea of calling. What is a calling? What Specifically, what does it mean to have a calling in, in light of the calling that Ezekiel experienced? And, and I want to do this by, by sharing four observations. The first one is this. When God calls, it's a vocation, not a job. 
When God calls, it is a vocation, not a job. Even an unemployed priest being held prisoner in an oppressive city 500 miles from his home, 500 miles from his place of employment, uh, could be called. Because it's not about a paycheck, it's not a, a job title, it's not about being recognized as any kind of authority. It is a vocation, a calling. That's, that's what the word vocation means. By the way, vocation is the English power word this week. If you're learning English, this, this is a word that would be good to know. In, in contemporary usage, vocation can mean a career path. It's something that you are particularly well suited for. So you might have a career in the food service industry, or you might have a career as a carpenter, or you might have a career in retail. We sometimes talk about that as being vocation. But I'm using vocation in a more traditional way. Vocation is when God speaks to you and asks you to do something. The, the word uh, vocation actually comes from a, a Latin word, vocatio, uh, which means to call or summon. To call or summon. Well, we have some other English words that are based on this same related root, such as, can you think of any other words that might be related? Vocal? Vocabulary. Vocabulary. And, and, and while you might choose a career path, you might choose a job, an actual vocation chooses you. That's, that's one of the primary differences. Perhaps God is calling you to make preaching or teaching or caring for the sick or caring for broken people the focal point of your life energy, what, everything that you've got. Even if it never becomes an actual job. Even if nobody ever pays you to do this kind of stuff. We're all called to follow Jesus. But some of us have a special calling to follow Jesus by taking care of broken people. Some of us are called to serve Him as ministers of word and sacrament. That, that's what ordination recognizes, that, that God has called a man or a woman to give his or her life over to leading in the church or leading in his mission, and, and specifically through teaching and preaching and sacraments, uh, a call that, that they take so seriously that they train for it. I brought my uh, certificate of ordination this morning. This certifies that Bradley Lee Boydston has been ordained a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ by the Evangelical Covenant Church, by the laying on of hands by the proper officers and the customary solemnities at the Minneapolis Auditorium, Minneapolis, Minnesota, on the 20th day of June in the year of our Lord, 1985. So that would have been 30 years ago, less than two weeks ago. So it's been 30 years since I was ordained. And, and, and ordaining, uh, ordination is not the calling. That doesn't, uh, it, it's not the calling itself, but it is the recognition of the calling, that the church recognizes that a, a person has a, a calling and that they are going to use it within the context of the ministry of the church. And, and, and in that sense, it is a permission-giving kind of thing. In, in our own fellowship, we have um, we have um, ordained the Word and Sacrament, which is what my ordination is, uh, and most of the pastors are ordained this way. And, and then we've got a, a second ordination called ordained the Word and Service, and these are people who have a calling that the church recognizes in, in a specialized area. So, for example, uh, if somebody is, feel, is called to youth ministry for their life, they, they might be ordained a word in service in a youth ministry. Or music. You know, they, they train for music. Or, or we, even, we have one woman that is ordained a word in service who is a veterinarian. She, she uses her, her skills with animals 
to, to help with the mission of the church. And, and, and so that's just another way that, that we do it. Uh, ordination does not mean that other people cannot or should not teach, but that there are some called to make that their life. That, that is how they are responding to the call of Jesus on their lives. And, and I would suggest that some others are called uh, to, by God into business. Some people are called by God into education, or some are called into science. Some are called into medicine. These can all be vocations if someone is re responding to the voice of God. Now sometimes when the Lord calls us to do something, we can do it within the context of a job. You can get paid for it, but, but often we do it without getting paid. It's not always a paying job. And often it's not even an officially recognized position. For example, one can fulfill a calling to teach or to write without ever being gainfully employed as a teacher or a writer. Sometimes a job is the context in which we exercise vocation, but for, for most people in the world, a vocation does not lead to a paying job. As, vo as vocation goes, jobs are overrated. You, you can even faithfully live out your calling if the world around you is unraveling. And, and the situation is less than ideal. And that there are no opportunities for advancement. As this was the case with Ezekiel, right? And, and, and I'd suggest that most or that the, the most influential people in the world, at least on a street level, will, will never have an official position. They will never have a leadership job. But as they respond to what God is calling them to do, they are, they are gently and they are quietly shaping the world. And that's good. That's enough. Number two. When God calls, He grabs our attention. When God calls, he grabs our attention. So the Lord calls Ezekiel. The, the beginning of that call is recorded in chapter 1 with this whole battery of strange, awe-inspiring images. You'll have to go home and read Ezekiel 1 to, about wheels and lights and just strange stuff. That, that, uh, this was not just a flight of fancy created by his own mind. This was not the kind of weird stuff that he would imagine to support his call. If he were trying to, to, to explain to people that he was called, he wouldn't have come up with this kind of stuff. God was definitely directing him. Now sometimes it is not a dramatic event. If the context warrants it, God can do drama. And sometimes he does. But more often he grabs our attention in other ways. Uh, I, I'm thinking of my own pastoral call. I did not really want to be a pastor. I kind of danced around it for years uh, before the year that I spent serving the, uh, the Berkeley Covenant Church as a youth minister. That's when I was also working in the cheese store. And in many ways, that was a significant year for me, but, but in terms of vocation, it was by working alongside uh, Pastor Craig Anderson that, that I caught a vision for this kind of mi mission-driven pastoral ministry. It was a little different, and I caught a vision for it. I'd, I'd spent a lot of time with pastors over the preceding years, but I didn't start to hear the voice of God in terms of it being a, a, a lifelong thing for me, a lifelong vocation until I was hanging out with Craig. God grabbed my attention through observation and, and discussion, conversations with him. And from that point, lots of things started to shift around and I was able to, to find focus in my life. Number three. When God calls, it's rarely easy. When God calls, it's rarely easy. Staples Office Supply has had an ingenious promotional gimmick for the last few years. It is the easy button, right? You've all seen it. They want you to think and believe that when you deal with them, that everything comes together easily. Well, maybe that's true when it comes to buying paper clips, but, but it's rarely the case when God calls. 
Think of the disciples that were sent out in the gospel text uh, that, that Jeffrey read for us a few moments ago. Do you, do you think that that was an easy assignment, being sent out? Uh, tomorrow is the 600th anniversary of the execution of uh, Jan Hus. Jan Hus. This guy here, Jan Hus. Uh, um, he, he is the Czech leader who attempted to reform the church a hundred years before the Protestant Reformation. But we can trace some of our roots as a covenant church directly to his Moravian followers and their influence. And, and Hus was burned at the stake. Sometimes the call of God moves that direction. Just because God is behind it, that doesn't mean it will be easy. It, it doesn't usually, he doesn't usually call us to do easy things. The reason that he is calling us is that it is a difficult situation. Listen again to verses uh, 3 through 7 and, and count the number of times that, uh, it, that God tells Ezekiel that there is no easy button. How many statements does he make to that effect? Uh, do, do your counting as I read, or if you want to follow along in the message guide, you can, you can count. He said to me, human one, I'm sending you to the Israelites a traitorous and rebellious people. They and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. I'm sending you to their hard-headed and hard-hearted descendants, and you will say to them, The Lord God proclaims, whether they listen or whether they refuse, since they are a household of rebels, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And as for you, human one, don't be afraid of them or their words. Don't be afraid. You possess thistles and thorns that subdue scorpions. Don't be afraid of their words or shrink from their presence because they are a household of rebels. You, you'll speak my word to them whether they listen or whether they refuse. They are just a household of rebels. Now, how, many, how many statements did God make in there to emphasize this point? Did anybody get a number? You got eight? Somebody else got a number? I got 10, but you know, your, your mileage may vary. You can it, see, configure in different ways. Okay, yeah. I mean, it depends on how you break the text down, but the point is that the Lord wanted Ezekiel to know that he was sending him into a tough situation. In other words, don't freak out because you're going through a rough patch. It does not mean that you are doing something wrong if you're going through a rough patch. Too often we, we, we go forward with the idea that if God is behind something, that it will come together smoothly, without much effort, without much opposition, as though, you'd, as though God were some kind of easy button. Think about, the, about Jesus in our Mark 6 passage. He was drawing crowds. He was healing people. It, this was exactly what he was called to do. But his hometown ridiculed him. They, they tried to make it hard for him. If, if this happened to Jesus, do you think that his followers, the people walking in his footsteps, should expect an easy button out of God? Here in Ezekiel 6, God is reminding the prophet, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of hard. Number four, when God calls, he empowers. When God calls, he empowers. This is the key point this morning, and I think it's what glues all the other points together. And I love verses 1 through 2. In verse 1, Ezekiel reports, the voice said to me, human one, or in some of your translations, son of man, uh, stand on your feet and I'll speak to you. And, and here's the ABD, the authorized voice and paraphrase. God said to me, man, get up off your butt, stand up ready to listen and act because I'm about to give you your marching orders. Then verse 2, as he spoke to me, a wind came to me and stood me on my feet and I heard someone addressing me. In, 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 in Hebrew, the, the, the language of the Old Testament, the, the, the word for wind, 
breath and spirit are the same word. Ruach. In the famous chapter of Ezekiel 37, uh, you know where, where he's in this valley of dry bones and he has this vision and, and God is putting his breath into these reconstituted bones. The, the wind that breathes life into those dry bones is the breath of God. It is the Spirit of God. It, it's the same word that is used here to describe what makes Ezekiel standing. And, and as with all sophisticated literature, there can be multiple meanings packed into the single use of a word. So the wind spirit of God comes and pushes Ezekiel to his feet. This is the power of God putting Ezekiel in a position to hear and to act. God is empowering the prophet to speak. He's putting him on his feet. When God calls, he empowers. If God is calling you to do something, he is going to be involved in the situation. And that's the reason why Ezekiel does not have to be afraid. God keeps saying, don't be afraid. No, they're going to be, th don't be afraid. They're going to do that. Don't be afraid. And, and, and that's the reason why when God calls you to something that is out of your comfort zone, as it often is when God calls, that you do not have to freak out. You should fully expect a wind to come and stand you on your feet. When God calls, He empowers. But again, think about Jesus called by the Father to live among us, to serve us when we should have been the ones who were serving Him. He came to serve us, to die for us without a cause, and, and then to break through the death barrier. None of this would be possible for Jesus, even for Jesus. This was impossible stuff, even for Jesus. When He became a man... The, the, the son set aside his power. He put them on the shelf. He put them in the cupboard. And when, when Jesus was born as a human being, he set aside his powers and he had to depend on the power from the Father and from the Spirit who enabled him to do all of this. When God calls, he empowers. Has God been calling you to do something? Something that you've been fearful to embrace. Or, or maybe you are in the middle of responding to that call and you are afraid that you can't handle it, that, that you are going to unravel, that you are going to fall apart. Uh, I'm here to tell you this morning that if you are responding to the call of God, whether that involves taking care of difficult children or starting a child care center, or, or preaching and teaching, or caring for the sick, in, in spite of the challenges, and in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the difficult people, the, in, in spite of the stress, and, and the apparent lack of means in it all. You don't have to be afraid. You will not unravel. For when God calls, He empowers. And that is the good news. Who would be willing to add some more insight or, or ask a question or, or share a word of testimony on this one? I don't mind it all, and neither do the rest of us. Also, when God calls, it's like a test of faith. When you talk about being afraid, that's just the reverse of, you know. If you believe and trust in God with all your heart, which we say we do when we confess to the Lord as our Savior, then when you step out into the thing that He is pushing you into, it's not you that's going, it's Him that's driving you. It's Him that's putting you on your feet to do it. Absolutely. It's exactly it's a different right. thing. Very good. Very good. Someone else? I'm thinking about when we needed to raise support to go to Guam. It was a huge amount that we had to raise, and it seemed impossible. 
And so because of that, you said, well, then there's no way I can do it. And so then that was just really freeing and releasing because there was no way we, we could do it on our own. And so we'll just sit back and wait and see what God provides. And so that was actually, the impossibility was actually freeing. The, the, the stretch that the impossibility of it all was freeing. Yeah, because then you know that we it had no has control. to be God doing We had no control over it. We couldn't make it happen. Yeah. So. And, and that becomes kind of a paradigm for everything we do. Yeah. You know, when, when we think about the impossibility of the things that God calls us to do, it, it just, it, if God is calling us to do it, it's probably impossible. And I think there are other people are working with you. Once you hear God's call. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's not just you. Uh -huh. Yeah, God rarely calls us by ourselves. Yeah. You know, it's, it's in the and context of this community. For that mission. Yeah. Because the first word I hear from you, mission, you are the one. I don't need to interview anymore. Oh. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And that was part of the that was part of the finances. Yeah, Daisy was part of the answer to that that financial problem. <laughs> Daisy was the the pastor of the Guam United Methodist Church where we ended up, and and, and Cheryl went to work for her. Cheryl was her secretary, part time. Someone else want to add?